So today we are covering the first two sections of chapter seven. We're dealing with inverse trig functions. And yes, you did a little bit of inverse trig functions when you were in uh, algebra two. Not a lot, but a little bit. Okay. For an inverse to exist, a function has to be one to one. It has to pass the horizontal line test. Okay. In order for it to exist, it has to pass the horizontal line test. The vertical line test, remember, tells us whether or not something's a function. The horizontal line test tells us whether or not it's one to one. It's not one to one, but the inverse is not a function. Okay. Trick graphs don't do that for particular. If you look at the sine graph and the cosine's the same way, they do not pass the one, the horizontal line test. That fails the horizontal line test. It's obvious it fails the horizontal line test. So we have to make adjustments. We are smart, intelligent people. Okay, when we do this, we are smart, intelligent people. In order to make it work for the sign, And for the cosine, fails the horizontal line test. And the tangent, oops. there we go. The tangent also fails the horizontal line test. All trig functions fail the horizontal line test. They touch it more than one place. They pass the vertical line test, but not the horizontal line test. So how do we deal with that? There we go. What we do is we restrict the domain and range of our inverse functions. So the inverse sine. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, you're not doing that to me now. Okay. So, so for the inverse sine, we restrict our domain. We restrict our domain of the inverse sine to the range of the regular sine function. So we only concern ourselves with values from negative 1 to 1. And our range, and this is important particularly for a lot of the work that we are doing coming up, our range is restricted to negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So when we are dealing with trig functions, when we're dealing with the sign, our inverse signs, no matter the value we have, our output is only going to concern ourselves with that. We only work with that portion of the unit circle for the inverse sign. Okay. For the cosine, our domain is still the same. Negative 1 to 1. And that makes sense, because what's our output for the sine and cosine? Negative 1 to 1. You take the sine of a number, it's always going to be, remember the graph, it's always going to be between negative 1 and 1. Same thing for the cosine, between negative 1 and 1. So we have to limit that anyways, because for inverse functions, the domain of one is the range of the other, and vice versa. So the range of sine and cosine are negative 1 to 1. What we also need to do in here in order to be able to get a single answer rather than multiple possible answers, we limit our range. The range for the cosine is slightly different. It covers that portion. So no matter what we put in, we have more than one possible answer, but we're saying, hey, we're restricting what our possible answers can be in. And for the tangent, the domain is all real numbers. We can take the tan inverse tangent of anything. Our range is the same range that we use for the sine. 
Now, I kind of skipped over a little bit what's going on here. We have talked about it. What exactly are inverse tree functions? Well, the inverse sine, normally if we have the sine of y is equal to x, swap them here and solve for y. We get y Actually, it's, 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 uh, screw that. Inverse functions. Okay. I'm having a day. Deal with it. That's the inverse trig function. What they do is they undo each other. When you see sine to the negative one power, that is not one over the sine. What is one over sine? Because you can't. It's not negative sine of the negative one power is not one over the sine. It is by definition the inverse trig functions. There's only a couple of times where something with the negative one power is not one over that object. Inverse trig functions is one of them. What that means is what value of x gives me that particular angle to go with it. That's what we're looking for. If we find if we know what the trig value function is. We're looking for the angle that gets set. Y is the angle, X is the trig value. Okay. When we're dealing with the cosine, it's the same thing. Okay. Y equals the inverse cosine of X. And you can do the inverse trig functions for the other one. You don't see them a whole lot, but you can do them. I'm not sure if we actually do any of those. We do a couple of them today. Inverse trig functions. What you're doing is you're taking the trig value and finding the corresponding angle to go with it. You did that in algebra 2 with right triangles. You knew the sides, you needed to find an angle. How'd you do that? You use the inverse tangent or cotangent or tangent or cosine or sine. To, to, to find the angle by using the inverse trig function. When I was your age, they didn't have sine to the negative one power. We used arc sine. A R C S I N. I'm guessing the reason we don't use arc sine and we use sine to the negative one power instead, because they mean the exact same thing, is because it's harder to put arc sine on the top of a little key on a calculator. But sine to the negative one power fits just fine, so somebody changed it over from when I was your age. So when I was your age, we didn't have sine to the negative one power. Sine to the negative one meant one over the sine. To, to, to find the angle, you use the arc sine. That was the inverse function. They changed it. When you take the AP calculus test, they actually say on the front page of the AP calculus test, they tell you that arc sine and inverse sine are the same thing, just in case you learn one way or the other way, and it's different on the test. It's the only place I ever see arc sign anymore is an explanation on the AP calculus test page. Okay. Um, graphs for the inverse trig functions. Okay. The sine function, I'm going to draw it up. We're going to do it up here. So when you did the sine function, come on. Oh, don't do that to me. Never mind. Okay, when you did the sine function, what did it look like? It looked like this. I know that's a crappy looking one. I don't care. Okay. Our inverse one will not be the whole thing like that. We can't do that because then it won't be a function. Okay. So what we do instead is we limit our domain and range. That's where our domain and range limit. Our inverse sine function. Is just that. And it literally does end here and here at 1. Actually, no, that's not 1. This is pi over 2. And this is negative pi over 2. And it goes from 1, negative 1, to 1. The inverse cosine looks like that. And our domain is, once again, negative 1 to 1. Our range is from 0 
two pi. Okay, and on the tangent, what was the range? The range was all real numbers. Our, our, sorry, our domain was all real numbers. Our range was negative pi over two to pi over two. The inverse tangent function looks like that. And it maxes out at pi over two, and it minimizes out at negative pi over two. Basic some trig functions. And the things you need to remember more than anything else when you're working with stuff today is when we use inverse trig functions, we limit ourselves and our values. Because otherwise, we can have a whole bunch of angles that give us the same answer. Okay, if you look at your unit circle, and we're going to be doing that, messing with that in a minute, you'll understand why. So if you don't have your unit circle out, you might want to bust out your unit circle. I do have a partial one up here with a couple of noted changes that I will talk about in a second. Okay, a couple of noted important changes that I will talk about in a second. Okay, you will, like I said, you will notice on the board I have a unit circle. I only have a partial unit circle. I only have a partial circle, partial unit circle for one reason. Our, our range is limited for our trig functions. Our output is limited. Otherwise, we would have an infinite number of possible answers for every one of these problems. We don't want an infinite number of answers. We only want a particular range of answers. So all of our answers have to fall within a certain circle, a certain portion of the circle. Our cosine values. are all within that. Our answers will be within that range. Any cosine that we find will be in that range. Our answers will be there. Our tangent and sine cover that portion of the unit circle. That's the portion our tangent and our sine cover. Please note the values of the radians in the lower portion in quadrant four. Do they match what you have on your unit circle? No. Are they correct values? Yes, we're just counting backwards. Because normally what happens when you go positive, you go, you go counterclockwise. When you go down, you, you go clockwise. So we start at zero and go down pi over six, go down pi over four, go down pi over three, go down pi over two. That's why it counts in the negative direction. And if you look at your notes, what is our range for the sine and the tangent, inverse sine and inverse tangent? Negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So our signs come from those two quadrants. Our cosines, signs and tangents come from quadrants one and four. Our, ten, our cosine come, inverse cosine values come from one and two. Okay, this is by definition. Because otherwise, how many answers would we have? For example, the inverse sine of one half. Where is the y value of one half on your unit circle? At pi over six, and on your unit circle, not the one I have up on the board, where else is it? Because I you notice I removed it. Where is the y coordinate of one half? It happens twice on your unit circle, right? And technically, it happens an infinite number of times, because how many times can we go around the circle? As many times as we want. So we could say that it's pi over six, or five pi over six, or uh, let's see, this would be 13 pi over six, or 17 pi over six. Or we could count backwards to where we get negative, um, negative 11 pi over 6, or sorry, negative 
7 pi over 6, negative 11 pi over 6. We have an infinite number of poss possible answers where the sign is 1 half. We must limit our domain so we only have one answer, not a gazillion of them. So our one answer is the one value that follows, falls within that range that we have. Our range for that answer, the sine of one half, or the inverse sine of one half, pi over six. Negative root 2 over 2, yes. So when you're inverse, when you're doing the inverse, um, why is the answer for like the sign, the inverse sign of 1 half? It's, it's the, the angle. It's the angle, but it's the angle that the sign of 1 half. Right, okay, because the sign of pi over 6 is 1 half, correct? Oh, right, so, so the inverse sign of 1 half is equal to pi over 6. It's what angle gives us that sine value. So the inverse is the, the, inverse. the, the, the value instead of the angle. Right, right. What it is is that we're, we're, we're finding the angle from the value instead of the value instead of the value from the angle. That's what the inverse trick is. Just, um, but think about squaring and square roots. Yeah. It's the same thing as squaring and square roots. You square 2 to get 4, you take the square root of 4 to get 2. They undo each other. And that's what we're doing here. The inverse trig function tells us what angle gives us that value of sine. That's why technically there's an infinite number of sine angles that we can take the sine of and get one half. We need to narrow that down. Otherwise, I could never get done grading tests because everybody would have a different answer. Could, in theory, have a different answer. I don't want to do that. Okay. So, negative root 2 over 2. The inverse sine of negative root 2 over 2. Where do you find the inverse sine of negative root, root 2 over 2? On your unit circle, not on what I have on the board. At two places, right? At, what's this, 5 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4, right? Are either one of those within the range of our answers? No. No, because where are we supposed to go from? What did you say in your notes that your range is? Negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Neither one of those are in the right range. That's why I put these negative values on here. So where do we have it? We have it at negative pi over 4, which is corresponds to what? It corresponds to 7 pi over 4. But if we count backwards, it's negative pi over 4. They have the same angle measurement. You need to give me the correct answer, which means you need to follow the correct range. So this is negative pi over 4. Your answers have to fall within the correct range. And that's what I'm trying to get to see the connection between the two. And why do we limit it? So we only have certain ones. And by definition, we go from here to here. Okay? And part of this deals with the graph, too. Because if we didn't, if we have, where do you have negative, where do you have negative y values? You have negative y values here and here. Well, we're not going to use these two quadrants, 1 and 3, to give our answers. We're not going to have disconnected possible answers. So they have to be connected together. And we're not going to go from 0 to pi over 2 and then from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, which we did disconnected as well. We need to have a connected section. So that's why we go from the negative to the positive on that. Cosine of zero. Pi over two. Okay, and this is where it gets a little harder. Because the values on your unit on your unit circle are not both x and y, are they? I mean they are x and y, which is sine and cosine. None of these are tangent, are they? So you'll notice. I don't have any y values over here in this quadrant because they are irrelevant to finding the inverse tangent. Only inverse cosine appears, comes up in quadrant two. 
in order for it to be a tangent, it's got to be in the other two quadrants, quadrant one or quadrant four. So if it's negative, it comes from down here. If it's positive, it comes from up here. Remember, tangent is what? Sine over cosine. Y over X. If I have a positive tangent, that means both the X and Y are positive. If I have a negative tangent, one's negative, one's positive. That tells me which quadrant to look in, and then I can go from there. Yes? So basically, um, the reason you say like negative pi over 3 for under 3, and the right angle over 3 Yep. Okay, so, um, da -da 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 -da. so we're looking for the inverse tangent of negative root 3 over 3. All right. What do you have? Five or six. And this is really, this is really, you have to remember which one's which. You have to remember which one's which. Because you're doing sine over cosine. You're doing the y coordinate over the x coordinate. So if I have the same denominator and I'm putting a fraction over a fraction, the denominator's the same. It's just the numerator over the denominator. So if I have 1 over root 3, that's going to simplify to root 3 over 3. If I have root 3 over 1, that's going to simplify to the square root of 3. You just got to figure out which one's which and, 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 and learn how to recognize to break it down from these two here. There's no shortcut to it. Okay, So this one would be negative pi over 6. Take a second, do the next three. Okay, it shouldn't take that long. What's the inverse cosine of negative root 3 over 2? 5 pi over 6. What is the inverse tangent of 1? Pi over 4. And the inverse tangent of inverse sine of negative 1? Negative pi over 2. Okay, now the next ones are a little bit more difficult. The secant is... 1 over cosine. So you need to find the inverse trig function that's going to give you where if you take the cosine, you flip it over, you get 2. And then, sorry, negative 2. So which one are you looking at? Yeah, negative 2 pi over 3. Because if I take this and flip it over, what do I get? I get negative 2. So this is the cosine, oh, sorry, this is 3 pi, 2 pi over 3. Oh my god. Heaven of day. Cotangent of negative 1. Okay, so if I have a tangent of 1, what does that mean? That means sine and cosine have the same value. Cotangent of 1, what does that mean? Sine and cosine have the same value. If it's negative, that means 1's negative and 1's positive. Where do I have where one's negative and one's positive? 
negative pi over 4. And the cosecant, you see root 2. What should you be thinking about with root 2? Should be pi over 4. Right? Something pi over 4. If you see root 2 involved, if you see the square root of 2 involved anywhere in a trig function, it involves something pi over 4. And because we have a limited range, and it's a key, cosecant is the sine, right? Inverse of the sine, not the cosine. That's going to be where? That's going to be positive pi over 4 because it's positive root 2. What, what do you hmm? What do you, okay, so if you did that. Yeah. If you took the square root of 2 over 2, root 2 over 2 and flipped it over, and simplified it, you'd end up being root 2. Okay. These are not as easy as they look. They are not as easy as, as they look. Although the first one's going to prove me wrong, but that's okay. Okay, what is the sign of pi over 3? So we want to take the inverse sign of root 3 over 2. What is the inverse sign of root 3 over 2? Pi over 3. And I know some of you are thinking, oh, wow, that's easy. It's just whatever I put. No, it's not. Because let's do the next one. What is the sign of pi of five pi over four? What is the inverse sign of negative root two over two? And it's not five pi over four. Oh, negative pi over four. Negative pi over four. Here's the difference between these first two problems. The first one, the original angle, the original angle was within the range of the inverse function. The second one, the original angle is not within the range of the original function. If the original angle is not part, is not within the range of the inverse function, then your output is not going to be what you're sticking in. So the first one, the reason it's pi over 3, is because pi over 3 is a valid answer for the inverse trig function. It is within our range of inverse trig values that we can get. 5 pi over 4 is not within this range of trig functions. 5 pi over 4 is not between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So our answer will not be what we put in to begin with. So you have to be careful. Okay, so the next one, we have the... Cosine of the sine of 2 pi over 3. What's the sine of 2 pi over 3? And what do you get for that? Mm, no. Sorry, no. For the... Not the final answer. You end up getting root 3 over 2. Right? The sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And what is the inverse cosine of root 3 over 2? Pi over 6. Okay. Do the next two. Do not do the last two. They are different. Do the next two. Do not do the last two. They are different.
So you get the inverse sine of negative root 3 over 2, which is negative pi over 3. On this one, you have the inverse tangent of negative 1, which is negative pi over 4. Now, the last two we have some problems with. They are not the same. Okay. Paraphrase Sesame Street. Two of these things are not like the others. Is there a sign? Is there a angle on your unit circle that has a sign value of five thirteenths? No, nowhere. Is there a Tangent, then it has one and a half. There are sine and cosine, but there are not tangent values of one and a half. Your tangent values are either zero, one, undefined, root three, or root three over three, plus or minus. So one and a half is not one. So those are obviously not from your unit circle. Oh, okay, when it's not from your unit circle, we're talking right triangle trig. That's what we're dealing with. If we do not have a unit circle, those are not values that are found somewhere on the unit circle, then we are dealing with a whole other beast, which means you ignore this and you do right triangle trig. So the inverse sign means that we have, okay, some angle. Here's our right triangle. Some angle theta, whose sign is 5 over 13. That's what that inverse trig function tells us. So we have an angle, theta, we don't know what that angle is, but it has a sine value of 5 over 13. The side opposite over the hypotenuse, 5 over 13. To find the tangent, what do I need to have? I need to have the other side, right? Which is what? 12, good. Pythagorean triple, 5, 12, 13. You should know that. Learn it. Live it. So what is the tangent of of the angle theta using the 5, 12, 13 triangle. 5 over 12. So your answer is 5 over 12. Yes? Okay, well, if you know the angle and one side, you can look for that. But, but when it's the same idea, if you were to take, okay, if you were to take the sine of this angle here, what would you get? 5 thirteenths, right? So this sets up this triangle here. Now you could, you could, on your calculator, take the inverse sine of 5 thirteenths, get some number, and then take the tangent of that, and you would end up with the same thing. But it's better if you understand what's going on here. This is actually easier. That's the same, that's the same angle. Yeah. Yeah, because... The angle's still involved. It has to be the same angle. This is our angle theta. We have this. This tells us our theta that replaces this has this condition. Okay. So we do the same thing on the next one. Okay. I have my angle theta, and the angle is, the tangent is one half, which means that I have one over here and two over there. This is not a Pythagorean triple. You do need to use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for the missing side, which in this case is the square root of 5. Square the first, square the second, add them together to take the square root, square root of 5. So we have this situation due to this given information given. What is the sine of that angle? 1 over root 5. And if you simplify the radical, what do you get? Root 5 over 5. Question. Yes? So for like this Now, inverse trig functions are extremely useful. We will discuss that use considerably in one of the chapters when we come back. Okay. Not the first one when we come back. It's, I think, second or third.
Yes. There will not be a test on chapter seven when we get back. So let me so let me.